Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce Dr. Janet Geringer Wojtitz, author of Marriage on the Rocks, Going Home, a reentry guide for the newly sober, and the best selling book, Adult Children of Alcoholics. Dr. Wojtitz is a consultant on families affected by alcoholism. In her private practice, she specializes in working with these families. The title of her new book, The Struggle for Intimacy, is the subject of today's talk. Dr. Wojtek. Hello. It's a pleasure to see all of you here today. As you know, today we're going to be talking about intimacy. Is there anyone here who is not interested in having a healthy, intimate relationship? Is there anyone here who knows what it is? It's not interesting. It's something that we all want, and yet we're not real sure exactly what it is. Well, what we're going to do today is talk about what a healthy relationship is, what it looks like. We're going to talk about some of the ways that adult children of alcoholics and people coming from dysfunctional families have been set up to struggle for intimacy, and perhaps some of the ways that that struggle can be eased. What is a healthy relationship anyway? What does it look like? A healthy relationship involves two individuals. Two people come together, and in coming together, they can maintain themselves as individuals, but because of the relationship, they are more than they would have been alone. They can grow as individuals and are enhanced because they are a couple. I am more because I have you, and you are more because you have me. I can continue to do the things that are valuable and important to me, and you will encourage and support that. You can continue to do the things that are valuable and important to you, and I will encourage and support that. You will accept me as I am, and I will accept you as you are. The key here is to be realistic. We do not fall in love with someone's potential. <laughs> and if you find yourself falling in love with someone's potential, once again you are playing out your life script. The child of the alcoholic lives in the fantasy world that if I am only good enough, if I only care enough, if I'm only smart enough, things will work out the way I want them to. In developing a healthy, intimate relationship, one needs to be realistic. And the couple grows and individuals grow, but you don't go into it with the notion that your fantasies are going to be fulfilled. A healthy, intimate relationship means that experiences which can be enjoyed by yourself are enhanced because you have that other person, such as looking at a beautiful sunset or taking a long walk, enjoying a delicious meal, and with that other person, you can learn more about each other and more about yourselves because you communicate and you talk to each other, not only about the things that you agree, but areas where you disagree and you learn to accommodate. This may sound like a very romantic notion. It is not. It is very, very possible. All that it requires is a commitment to the relationship and a commitment to work at the relationship. Essentially, a healthy relationship looks something like this. There is the area where the couples blend, which is somewhat flexible, but there is also the area where the couple is able to maintain itself individually. Individuals learn how to relate in relationships as a result, firstly, of what they experienced as children. I'd like you to take a moment now and reflect back on your own childhood. Reflect back on what you saw when you were growing up. Reflect back on the model that you had for a relationship. You probably decided 
that that was not what you wanted for yourself. You probably decided that what you were going to have was going to be real different. Is there anyone who is willing to share what it is that came to their mind when we were talking about this? How about you? Um, my mother was an alcoholic, and, and my father was, was weak. She, she dominated everything. She dominated the household, my father. I felt uh, very trapped, very alone. This is fairly typical, and if we were to diagram this, it would look something like this. The alcoholic would be the dominant person. Inside that is the spouse or the codependent, suffocated by the alcoholic. And then we have the child reacting to both the codependent and the alcoholic. A very suffocating experience, a place where there's no opportunity for individual growth or for individual expression. Now, since you grow up in a situation that looks something like this, chances are that in your own relationships, as a reaction to this, you did not develop what we were talking about here. You developed something that either looked like this, two people who looked as if they were getting along real well. That perfect couple that you see in the church on Sunday, side by side but not really connected. Or, because you were so determined that you were never going to be swallowed up again in a relationship, it's entirely possible that you end up in a relationship where you become dominant and, in effect, swallow up the other person. Do you relate to either of those two examples? Well, I really relate to both of them because I really have a fear of, of, of being close. I mean, uh, my mother was always a dominant one, so I, I've always wanted somebody to dominate me, but then when they start to dominate me, I become afraid and I, I want to dominate them. So consequently, I've not really had a satisfying relationship because of that. I'm, I'm just afraid of being close. Thank you. I think it begins to get a little bit clearer as to how you get set up. This is a setup. The, the relationships described here are a reaction to what happened to her as a child. Children of alcoholics really enjoy the early stages of the relationship, the infatuation stage of the relationship, where the body chemistries are flowing and you can't really get enough of each other, on the phone constantly, just want to be together. Feels a little bit like crisis, so it's awfully familiar. But the other part of it is that if you grew up in an alcoholic home, your needs were inconsistently met. You never really got all of the nurture that you wanted as a child or needed as a child. So as a result, there's a, a place there where you feel somewhat empty. And the initial stage of the relationship, I mean, you're not really looking for a healthy relationship, you're looking for fusion, okay? <laughs> the initial stage of the relationship really serves these needs, so it feels wonderful. Well. One can't really sustain that kind of fusion and survive. So it's not too long after one is involved in a relationship like this that one person may say to the other, I, I need to breathe. <laughs> and it will be translated something like, I would like to spend an evening by myself. The adult child, when this happens, will feel rejected because the needs are not being met at that point. And it's not unusual for them to try and clutch the person back or to simply leave and see if they can find another relationship where they can fuse. Are there a couple of people who would be willing to come up and participate in a demonstration? OK, how about you and you? Why don't you just come right up here? Are either one of you the adult child? Yes, I am. Oh, OK, fine. All right, now we're going to set up here. This is the early stage of a relationship, the infatuation stage. And I would like the two of you to get real close. Is, is this close? Is, is this what getting real close is all about? There we go. <laughs> OK, hey, not bad, not bad. Tell me, how does this feel? You like that? <laughs> how about you? Nice. <laughs> yeah, OK, here we are. 
the early stage of the relationship, needs are being met, feels just terrific. Okay, it's now about six weeks down the road. How are you feeling? Great. Great. How about you? It's okay. It's okay. It's not quite as wonderful as it was, but it's okay. He's still hanging in there. And we hang in, and we hang in. Now it's about two years. Okay? How you doing? Good. Yeah, well, her needs are still being met. She feels really great. What about you? Oh, I'm, I'm hanging. <laughs> he's hanging. <laughs> he, he may feel like he's being hung, okay? <laughs> but he's not really walking away yet. What would you like to do at this stage? I realize that you're hanging in. What would you like to do? Well, I need a little space but you're for just, myself. Yeah, but you're going to just serve her need for a while, huh? Yeah, I'll try. Okay, okay. <laughs> And this, here we are, now it's about five years. How are you doing, dear? She's doing just fine. What about you? Uh, I've got to back up. Okay, you've had it? Yeah. Okay, why don't you do what you need to do? How, how do you feel? Uh, feel rejected. You feel, yeah, you feel Abandoned. bad? Yeah. They just walked away like that? How about you? How are you feeling? I just need the space. Sounds like you're beginning to breathe again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, let me ask you a question. Are you, are you willing to work on this relationship? No, I think I'd rather not. You think you just, you're just done with it? Okay, thank you very much. He reached the point where he just couldn't deal. He didn't work with it along the way, and he just left. And here you are. Uh, how, what are you feeling? Kind of empty. Kind of empty? Alone? Yeah. And did you do anything to cause that? No. Not really. Not really. There's no sense that she was responsible for what went on. Um, maybe we can work something else out for you. Okay, that was not your last opportunity for a relationship. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have, we, have we got anybody else to be... Oh, yeah, okay, here we go. You see? See how easy that is? Okay. Um, uh, this is Leanne, is that your name? Luann. Luann, and you're... Uh, Derek. Derek, I'd like the two of you, now we're going to start this new relationship, I'd like the two of you to get in real tight, real close. Okay. Okay, are you a COA, Derek? No, no I'm not. Okay, here we go. And now we're back here again, we're at six weeks. You doing okay? Mm -hmm. And what about you? Feels fine. Yeah, they're great. Let's go a little further. Let's go back to that two-year point again. And you? Good. She's good. She's satisfied. <laughs> She's satisfied. What about you? How are you feeling? Pretty good. Pretty good. It's not quite wonderful, but it's still pretty good. And now, let's take it a couple years down the road. Tell me, how are you feeling right now? I'm feeling a little closed down. I, I could use a little extra space. What would you like to do? Withdraw a little. Why don't you do that? Well, it looks like he withdrew a little differently, didn't he? Yeah. H how does this feel? Okay, I thought he was going to walk across the room. Oh, you thought he was going to leave? <clears throat> yeah. No, it looks like... It's okay, I, it's kind of hard to trust, though, but... Okay. So this relationship has the potential for being healthy. He did not back all the way. He said, I need a little space, but I'm going to be here. And you're a little frightened. You're a little scared. Okay, I'd like the two of you to sit down for a while and get to know each other a little better. We'll see how this develops over time. Okay, thank you very much. Trust is a very big issue with children of alcoholics. Babies are born trusting. They trust that their needs will be met, that they will be fed, that they will be changed. And as they get to be a little older, we have to teach them not to trust. We have to teach them that they can't trust if they run out into the street that they won't be run over. We have to teach them not to trust that if they put their fingers on a hot stove they won't get burned. But they continue to trust us. And they can trust that the parent will be there for them. And the parent will serve their needs. And that is something that they can rely on. This is not true if you grew up in an alcoholic home. You could not depend on your parents. You learned how not to trust. Because if you trusted, you got violated. As an adult, in developing a healthy relationship, this needs to be turned around. And this is part of the struggle. Trust for adult children is never a simple issue. 
it means a whole lot of things. It means that feelings will not be abused and that they will be shared. It means that you can allow yourself to be vulnerable. If you grew up in a chemically dependent home, if you allowed yourself to be vulnerable, you were going to get hurt. Your feelings were going to get stomped on. So pretty soon you learned that you were the only one that could be responsible for your own happiness and other people could upset you and make you angry only if you permitted it. And that was absolutely true. It also is one of the things that distances you in developing a healthy intimate relationship because it becomes necessary to allow that other person access to your feelings. And that means that feelings will be enhanced. Good feelings and not so good feelings. So it is hard to trust and allow oneself to be vulnerable. It also means that there is a certain amount of honesty. It means that Derek says what he means and means what he says. If you grew up in a chemically dependent family, you experienced a whole lot of broken promises. At the time they said it, they meant it, but somehow it never really worked out that way. It means that the other person will not willfully hurt you, and you will not willfully hurt that other person. It means that there is a freedom not to be judged, that you can be you, and you don't have to be concerned about your every move and your every statement. A brand new experience for many children of alcoholics. It means no physical abuse. To many, this is what trust means, if they grew up in this kind of a home. And there is never an excuse or rationale for physical abuse in a relationship. It means stability and consistency. It means that that person will be for you tomorrow the way he or she was yesterday. You may translate that as boring. <laughs> that may be one of the ways that you identify the fact that you are involved in a healthy relationship. You consider it boring. Okay. Because that person's responses are the same. You can depend on them. You can count on them. Trust means that there is a loyalty and a commitment to the degree that the couple decides that they're going to be loyal and committed. It means that confidences will be kept and not used against you. It means a whole lot of things. So when she says, I want to work at it, but I don't trust it, it sounds like a real simple statement, but it's not. It's very complicated. It is also true that trust builds slowly. Patience. Adult children of alcoholics are very impatient. They are even impatient with the fact that they are impatient. <laughs> but trust builds slowly. I had a student of mine say to me, Jan, I want you to know I'm no longer going to give 100% in a relationship. You know, maybe 85, maybe 90%, no more 100%. And I said, hey, wait a minute. Many of us don't make that decision right off the bat, okay? Many of us decide maybe we're going to commit 5% to the relationship, 10%, and as the relationship develops and grows, then we'll see how much we want to invest in it. I think it's the difference between dabbling your feet in the shallow end of the pool and diving off the diving board and checking on the way down to see whether or not there is water in the pool. <laughs> so these issues are very real. Another aspect of a healthy relationship that needs to be turned around from childhood has to do with expectations. If you grew up in an alcoholic home, you could not have expectations because if you had an expectation, it would not be fulfilled. What happens then as an adult is you learn how not to want. Or even if you know what you want, you don't tend to ask for what you want. If you are developing a healthy, intimate relationship, it is possible to have expectations. It is part of what the relationship is all about. But it becomes important to be able to express your desires, your wants, your needs to the other person involved and to have them respond, not guess. What, where's our happy couple? What, would, you, would you come back over here? 
How, how's it going? Well, we had a nice little chat. Did you? Yeah. Did it go pretty well? Yes. You guys know each other a little bit? Yes. Yeah, we are. Great, great. Tell me, is there something you would like from, from him right now? <laughs> yeah. Would you uh, share that with us? Um, I can't really. Does, does he know what it is? I don't think so. She has something that she wants. And he doesn't know what it is. How are you going to get that need met? It's, it's hard for me to say. He knows that she wants something. But he doesn't know what it is that she wants. So how can he satisfy her needs? How can he give it to her? So we look at a relationship now, which is kind of stuck. If she doesn't get what she needs, chances are that some anger is going to build up. And he's not going to know what hit him. How do we get the couple unstuck? One of the places that becomes real significant when we work with adult children is to recognize that one of the things that did not happen as children was to get validated. Nobody said, however you feel is OK. Nobody said, I might not want you to do or behave this way, but it's important to me that you share what it is that's going on inside of you. As a result, they've never been validated. And they don't have the sense that, it is, that feelings are OK. In order to develop a healthy relationship, one needs to validate the other person. Because you validate doesn't mean you agree. If I'm late for an appointment, for example, and you are upset and angry, I am still late. But I can say to you, gee, if I was in your position, I'd be feeling that way too. I'd be upset and angry. But I want you to know what happened to me. I really couldn't do it any differently. But the validation of the other person's feelings enables important communication to take place. Do you know how she feels? Do you know what she wants? No. You don't know what she wants? No. Do you know how she feels? Yes. How, tell me, how do you suppose she feels? I think she's scared and insecure. Do you? Yes. Do you think you can validate those feelings? Yes. Why don't you do that? Okay. I understand how you feel. If I was in your position, I'd be scared too. But I'm right here, and I'm not going away. How did that make you feel? This feels good, yeah. It makes, it's good. Do you think you can share with him now what it is that you want? Yeah. <laughs> I want a hug. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. This, uh, the potential of this relationship seems to be growing by the moment. Because one of the things that started to happen there was that they began to be able to communicate with each other. They began to be able to share with each other some of what was going on inside. And they began to be able to solve a problem. This was becoming a problem. Her need, her desire was becoming a problem in this budding relationship. Children of alcoholics have never learned how to resolve problems. How many of you who grew up in an alcoholic home had a parent who came home and said, look, we've got a problem that needs to be solved as a family. I would like everybody to sit down. I care about what all of you think. And we will come to a decision as a unit. OK? Didn't really go that way. OK? <laughs> Didn't really happen that way. Well, that's part of what communicating is all about. So when you find as an adult that you struggle with this, that you don't know how to really communicate, that you don't know how to problem solve, it's another way that you've been set up. But communication involves a body of skills. These are tools that people can learn in order to communicate. And in order not to be afraid to share the feelings that they have. Because many feelings get real confused. When we talk about problem solving, there is generally some degree of anger. We might call it discomfort if it's just a little. But there's some degree of frustration, which translates as anger. And if you grew up in an alcoholic home, for some reason, anger got translated like this. If I am angry at you, I do not love you. And if you are angry at me, you do not love me. Therefore, if I love you, I cannot be angry at you. And if you love me, you cannot be angry at me. Therefore, we do not share any angry feelings. Okay? 
Therefore, meaningful roads to communication are blocked off because people do get frustrated with each other. People do get angry with each other. People do have problems that need to be resolved and that needs to be worked through. But all of this is learned. All of these skills are learned. It is a struggle, but it can happen. It can be turned around. The desire to get close is strong within children of alcoholics, but they're very afraid of it, as you expressed earlier. And many are afraid of becoming close because of the way they feel about themselves. They're afraid that if somebody really gets to know them, really gets to find out what they are really like, they won't want to bother with them. The truth is that you are not so terrible. The truth is that you are probably not terrible at all. You have just internalized the messages that you got as a child. Now is the time to begin to turn that around. Now is the time to begin to change that message. We begin changing that message by opening the lines of communication to ourselves to begin to develop healthy, intimate relationships with ourselves. The first person is you. I would like you to now take a moment and close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, I would like you to visualize that child within you. The three-year-old, the four-year-old, the eight-year-old, the child that suffered the most. And I would like you now to put your arms around that child, to be affectionate. To that child. Take a good look at that child. And as you hold that child, I would like you to say to that child what that child needs to hear. I would like you to say to that child what that child wants to hear. I love you. You are special. You are special because you are. You don't have to prove. I want to be close to you. I want to hold you. I will be there for you. I will give you what you need. And now, with your eyes still closed, I would like you to take the hand of the person on your left and the hand of the person on your right and send that energy through the room to be able to offer to others the love you have just demonstrated for yourself. That is the place to begin. Open your eyes. If you were able to embrace that child within you, you know how good that feels. Some of you may not be able to do that yet. And all this does is point out a direction that you may choose to work. The reality is that you can offer yourself all of the things that we talked about offering another person in a healthy, intimate relationship. You can offer yourself the consistent nurture that you require. You can trust yourself. You're very trustworthy. You can validate your own feelings and live up to your own expectations. That is the beginning of real communication, the communication with self. This is the beginning of the journey toward real intimacy. Thank you. <laughs>